The Lockheed story begins with the Lockheed brothers, Alan, Malcolm, and Victor, who were inspired by glider demonstrations and became interested in aviation. Victor was educated as an engineer and by 1910 had published two early technical work on aviation. Alan was inspired to learn to fly by Victor's interest in aviation, and Malcolm rose to prominence for developing a dependable hydraulic automotive brake. How did Lockheed become the Lockheed? Is their story similar to the Wright brothers who first invented the motor-operated airplane? If you want to know all of these answers, then keep watching Business Bank. Malcolm and Allen founded the Alco Hydro Aeroplane Company in San Francisco, California and built their Model G aircraft, an innovative but commercially unsuccessful design. During the Panama Pacific International Exposition in San Francisco, they offer rides in their Model G to the crowds, earning enough money to establish the Lockheed Aircraft Manufacturing Company in Santa Barbara, California. In 1916, the F-1, their first project, was the world's largest seaplane capable of carrying 10 passengers. This project was completed by Jack Northrop, a 20-year-old draftsman. In 1918, the F-1 flew for the first time and the brothers began building flying boats for the Navy. Following World War I, the company created the S-1, a single-seat biplane designed for civilian use that was never successful. Lockheed Aircraft was forced to close in 1921 due to financial difficulties. Malcolm Lockhead relocated to Detroit and found success with the hydraulic brake system he created for automobiles. He was tired of having his name mispronounced as Lockhead and he changed the spelling to Lockheed to match the pronunciation and used this name for his new company, the Lockheed Hydraulic Brake Company. In 1926, Allen rejoined Jack Northrop to form the Lockheed Aircraft Corporation, including the Lockheed spelling to associate with Malcolm's successful brake company. Their first plane was the Lockheed Vega, an extremely successful high-speed monoplane. The Vega became a popular choice for many of the world's top aviators, including Amelia Earhart and Wiley Post, with a range of 1,000 miles, a cruising speed of 185 miles per hour and seating for six people. Lockheed was sold to Detroit Aircraft Corporation in 1929, and Alan Lockhead left the company. The company thrived even though the brothers were no longer directly involved. Lockheed aircraft included the Electra, P-38, L-049 Constellation, and L-1011 Tristar, the famous flying Lockheed brothers. Alan H. Lockheed, one of three brothers who would become major American industrialists, led this new firm. Allen, along with his brothers Victor and Malcolm, was born with the surname Lockhead. It had a Scottish origin, but it was spelled in an Irish way and pronounced Lockheed. The pronunciation was never altered, but the spelling was altered twice. Victor was the first to use the new spelling, Lockheed. Allen and Malcolm changed the spelling to Lockheed much later in life. Victor was an automotive engineer, but he got his start in aviation as a writer, causing quite a stir with his 1909 Vehicles of the Air. He published his second book, Airplane Designing for Amateurs, in 1912. In 1911, Victor also designed the Taft Pierce Lockheed V8 engine. The engine is now on display at the Udvar of the National Air and Space Museum in Chantilly, Virginia, just outside Washington, D.C. Victor later became the editor of Motor Magazine and continued to work in aviation. Malcolm and Allen started their careers in San Francisco. Automobiles captivated both of them. Malcolm began his career in 1904 as a distributor for White Steam Car, where he invented and later patented the hydraulic four-wheel brake. Allen began working in an automobile repair shop in San Francisco in 1906. He was skilled behind the wheel and was hired by the Corbin Automobile Firm to demonstrate their vehicles in hill climbing exhibitions. Enter the airplane. An investor, James E. Plew, had hired Victor to acquire the rights to a tandem wing glider. Plew's goals was to install an engine and sell a powered aircraft. 
He also directed Victor to purchase a Curtis biplane. Victor hired Allen to work in the two-plane Chicago fleet. Victor and the other brothers later had a long feud. They reconciled just before he died in 1943. Allen Lockheed quickly realized that installing an engine in the glider was impossible, so he focused on making the Curtis biplane airworthy. He also learned to fly in the same way that he learned to design airplanes. He just did it. With no formal training, Plew bought a second Curtis, and Allen, a natural pilot, quickly rose to prominence at air shows. Both Allen and Malcolm were not engineers, but they were skilled craftsmen who eventually began to build their own aircraft. The Lockheed Model G was the largest seaplane ever built in America. The Model G was built in a garage near San Francisco's waterfront and flew for the first time on June 15, 1913. That was the beginning of a long line of Lockheed successes. The Model G caused quite a stir because it was the only aircraft flying in the Bay Area. The three-seat biplane made its owners a lot of money. The Lockheed brothers made $6,000 carrying over 600 passengers during the 1915 Panama Pacific Exposition. Soon after, Allen and Malcolm established the Lockheed Aircraft Manufacturing Company in Santa Barbara, California and used the Model G to generate revenue while working on their second design, the F-1. It was a bigger flying boat. It could transport a pilot and nine passengers thanks to its twin engines. The Lockheeds were fortunate in that they were able to hire Jack K. Northrop, a 20-year-old engineer draftsman, Anthony Staltman, who later loomed large in Lockheed Aircraft Corporation, was another good hire. The F-1 was a promising design and America's entry into World War II. And America's entry into World War I in April of 1917 prompted the brothers to seek a Navy contract for mass production. Allen went to Washington and impressed Lieutenant Colonel Jerome Hunsaker, who was then in charge of the Navy's aircraft engineering section. Hunsaker authorized a Navy test program for the F-1 and gave Allen a license to build two Curtis HS-2L flying boats. Within a few months, the small Lockheed plant was up and running. On April 12th of 1918, the F-1 flew nonstop to San Diego and work on the Curtis boats went smoothly. Lockheed began to secretly develop a new jet fighter at its Burbank facility in 1943. The Lockheed P-80 Shooting Star was the first American jet fighter to make a kill. It also achieved the first jet-to-jet -jet aerial kill, downing a Mikoyan Gurevich MIG-15 in Korea. Despite the fact that the F-80 was already considered obsolete, Lockheed's secret development work began with the P-80 and was carried out by its Advancement Development Division, also known as the Skunk Works. This name was inspired by the comic strip Little Abner by Al Cap. This organization rose to prominence and gave birth to several successful Lockheed designs, including the U-2 in the late 1950s, SR-71 Blackbird in 1962, and F-117 Nighthawk Stealth Fighter in 1978. Skunk Works was known for producing high-quality designs in a short period of time and, and with limited resources. This was the reason they were known as the military's right-hand men. Armistice and Suffering The Armistice of November 11th of 1918 dashed hopes for larger contracts. However, the F-1 was converted to a land plane transcontinental flight attempt. It was rebuilt as a flying boat and continued to earn money for the Lockheeds by transporting tourists and working with the film industry. Allen and Malcolm Lockheed, Northrop, and Stallman collaborated to develop a new manufacturing technique. The goal was to mass-produce and low-costly manufacture a streamlined aircraft known as the S-1. Their design called for the use of a concrete mold in the shape of a fuselage half three layers of laminated spiral strips of vertical grain spruce were placed into the mold. Each ply was coated with waterproof casing glue and bonded under extreme pressure for hours. The mold's two halves were joined to form a fuselage. The brothers discovered that they had spent $30,000 on the S-1 after designing and building their own engine. It flew well, but it was too expensive to compete with the hundreds of cheap post-war Curtis Genis and standard trainers. Thus, the first Lockheed venture came to an end. Malcolm packed his belongings and drove east to sell his patented hydraulic four-wheel brakes. 
Bendix Corp eventually bought the patent from him. Alan worked as his brother's brake distributor in California. He was also interested in real estate. However, Alan returned to aviation in 1926. He formed a new company, Lockheed Aircraft Corp, and began work on what would become the Vega. Alan's timing for the Vega was as good as it had been for the S1. He had several factors working in his favor. The right whirlwind air-cooled radial engine was the first to arrive. The second factor was the stock market's boom, which made it simple to obtain financing for this venture. Third, Jack Northrop, who had been working at Douglas while moonlighting at Ryan, became available again and joined Lockheed. Northrop and Lockheed believed that the manufacturing techniques that they had patented for their S-1 could be resurrected for a completely new plane. The molds were capable of producing six shells or three fuselages per week. The fuselage was extremely light and strong, and it could house engines with up to 715 horsepower. It was neat and adaptable. You could cut almost anywhere to make access hatches, doors, and so on. Despite having a standard length and diameter, because Lockheed only had one mold, the fuselage was adaptable to a wide range of wing placements, cockpit positions, and undercarriage types. The Cost of Adulation On May 25th of 1927, Pineapple Tycoon James D. Dole announced a $25,000 price for the first aircraft to fly from North America to Honolulu and a $10,000 prize for the second. The announcement, which came just after Lindbergh's triumph, threw a barrel of gasoline on the aviation bonfire. The prize money was tempting, but what the contestants really wanted was a taste of the adoration lavished on Lindbergh. Many Dull Derby competitors overlooked a basic fact in their eagerness to compete. Lindbergh could not have missed Europe entirely no matter how good a navigator he was. That was not the case for the Dole Derby competitors. They were taking off from the west coast of the US for a 2,439 mile journey to a tiny volcanic speck in the Pacific Ocean. Even a minor navigational error could have disastrous consequences. Alan Lockheed was not thrilled about the risky flight, but he remembered how quickly the S-1 project had devoured his $30,000. As a result, he jumped at the chance to buy the prototype Vega from George Hurst, son of newspaper magnate William Randolph Hurst, for $12,500. The plane had cost $17,500 to construct. The Vegas appearance in the Dole Derby, on the other hand, brought publicity on a scale that only Hurst could provide. The Vega appeared in newspaper articles everywhere, many with cutaway drawings showing all of the expensive navigation, communication, and safety equipment installed for the flight. Hearst hired two experienced pilots, pilot John W. Frost and navigator Gordon Scott, to crew the Golden Eagle. Tragically, the brand new Vega vanished during the flight, and its fate remains unknown. The Dole race claimed many other lives and became a symbol of America's aviation arrogance. Despite losing the prototype in the Derby, the Vega was an instant sales success. The negative publicity generated by the loss of Golden Eagle was quickly offset by a long string of other notable flights. After seeing test flights of the prototype, Captain George H. Wilkins ordered a Vega and partnered with Alaskan airmail pilot Carl B. Eilson to make an epic, perilous, transatlantic journey in April 1928. The two flew across the Arctic from Point Barrow in northern Alaska to Spitsbergen, north of Norway. Wilkins received the knighthood and Eilson received the Harlan Trophy and the Distinguished Flying Cross. They extolled the virtues of the Vegas speed, strength and comfort, and Lockheed was established as a viable business. 129 Vegas were eventually built and they were flown by nearly every famous American aviator of the time. Amelia Earhart flew across the Atlantic in her bright red Vega in 1932. Other female pilots, such as Bobby Trout and Ruth Nichols, set records in the Vega. Speeds should be recorded. Wiley H. Post flew a Vega on two epic round-the-world flights. The first with Harold Gatti as navigator in 1931 and the second solo in 1933. Both flights were in Winnipeg, his Vega. Post reached speeds of 340 miles per hour 
far exceeding what Alan Lockheed or Northrop had imagined for the Vega. Aside from setting records, Vegas was used as airliners, corporate jets, and air ambulances. The National Air and Space Museum houses both Earhart's and Poses Vegas. There were several variations on the basic Vega construct. The Air Corps bought one, the XP-900, and renamed it the YP-24. It had a new metal fuselage, a Curtis engine, and the standard Lockheed wind, and it could reach 214 miles in 1931. The company had done so well under Alan Lockheed's leadership that it drew the attention of the Detroit Aircraft Corporation, which declared its intention to become the General Motors of the air. The Lockheed company had evolved as a result of its success. Northrop resigned in June of 1928. Fred Keeler, Lockheed's major financial backer, hoped to make a large profit by selling the company to the DAC. Alan Lockheed left the company in 1929 refusing to see it sold. Keeler's sell-now instinct was correct, as it turned out. Within three months of the sale, the stock market crashed and the Great Depression began, sending the ambitious DAC holding company spiraling downward. Even during the Great Depression, DAC's Lockheed division continued to make a profit, but it could not save the overextended parent company. DAC went into receivership in 1931, and Lockheed closed its doors on June 16th of 1932, despite continuing sales and profits. On June 21st of 1932, a consortium led by Robert E. Gross purchased the assets and the company began a new life. Under the name Lockheed Martin Corporation, Gross determined that while the new company would continue to build wooden Lockheeds for the time being, it would eventually focus on all-metal aircraft. Allen Lockheed would have no place. After the original firm was purchased by Detroit Aircraft in 1929, Allen established a new company, the Allen Lockheed Corporation. Allen designed a new aircraft, the Olympic Duo 4, in collaboration with some of his former colleagues. The Olympic Duo 4 was essentially a Vega with twin Menasco engines mounted in an unconventional manner. The two 275 horsepower engines were installed side by side with only 12 inches of space between their propellers. Allen's goal was to ensure twin engine dependability. The plane flew quite well, but it had a string of bad luck. It took to the skies for the first time on March 18th of 1931 and was destroyed when it collided with a photographic truck at the runaway's edge. Allen bravely rebuilt it with larger engines, but he never sold any of the new models. He founded the Alcor Aircraft Corporation in Oakland, California in 1937. Allen believed that a twin-engine six-passenger feeder airliner could find a market. He rehired Stallman as CEO and hired Harold E. Webb as chief engineer. They designed the Alcor C6.1, a sleek, almost futuristic new aircraft. Despite its modern appearance, the new plane retained the traditional Lockheed wooden construction that had served the Vega and its variants so well. Allen created a circular fuselage this time. The C6.1 has been thoroughly tested. Allen Lockheed went to Washington to drum up military sales, but he left strict orders that the plane was not to be flown. Casterly and Webb decided to conduct another test flight. The plan was to climb to 16,000 feet and then dive at 300 miles per hour before leveling off for the return flight home. The left aileron ripped off during the dive, forcing the two men to bail out. Alan Lockheed's final plane spiraled down, making several full circles before crashing into San Francisco Bay. In such a flat attitude that it skipped like a well-thrown stone, tearing itself apart with each skip. One witness described the impact as like a salvo of 16-inch shells. Both men survived with minor injuries, but it was the end of the road for Alcor and Alan Lockheed's attempts at aircraft production. Neither Malcolm nor Alan Lockheed found solace in their previous accomplishments. Both were constantly on the lookout for the next big thing, hoping to recapture some of their early enthusiasm. It was not meant to be. Malcolm had sold his stake in his hydraulic brake company for a tidy sum, but he had clearly made poor investments. He tried gold mining 
before succumbing to public assistance on August 13th of 1958. Allen resumed real estate sales and aviation consulting while maintaining informal ties with the rapidly expanding Lockheed Aeronautics firm. He passed away on May 28th of 1969. By that time, the Lockheed company had grown into an American behemoth. And that brings us to the end of the video. Feel free to let us know what you think about this video. And if you like this video, then please leave a like and subscribe to our channel for more amazing content. Thank you for watching and we'll see you in the next one.